Attention, please. Eastern Airlines Flight 19, now ready for departure. Welcome aboard the Walt Disney World Express Monorail. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're entering the vacation kingdom of the world. There's enough land here to hold all of the ideas and plans we could possibly imagine. We call it Epcot. will be our experimental prototype city of the morning. Welcome to another episode of the Retro Disney World Podcast, taking you back to the vacation kingdom of the world, the way it was, and the way it is in your memories. All right, welcome to another episode of the Retro Disney World Podcast. This is episode 43, Game Shows at the Disney MGM Studios. I'm your host, Todd McCartney, and sitting in with me always tonight, Mr. J.T. Couser. How you doing, J.T.? Doing good. How are you, Todd? All right. All right. Got to close up the pool. Starting to get starting to get cool. I know, right? We had like a crazy monsoon for like 10 days. It felt like just all rain, and then it was kind of nice today. So it's yeah. kind of some crisp fall weather coming. Yep, it is definitely coming. And Mr. Hal Bowers from Tampa, Florida, where there is no such thing as autumn. Aloha. Nope. We go. <laughs> we go right from summer to bitter cold and then right back to summer again. <laughs> That's right. It's the two season state. Bitter cold of 70. That's right. We, hey, we get down to 30, 35 or so sometimes. All right. All right. Yes. Sometimes the marathon week. <laughs> sometimes it's 95 degrees that marathon week in January, and sometimes it's 40 degrees. Well, for us northerners, flying down in november uh you know just save a little bit of sunshine for us okay absolutely always it's at your call you know what i'll have walt turn the the turn the dome on oh, so perfect. Way, it's <laughs> nice when you come and another one from the northern states mr brian p miles coming in from philadelphia pennsylvania as always greetings from the commonwealth of pennsylvania new jersey's big brother and delaware's bodyguard <laughs> <laughs> delaware's bodyguard what do they mean by that Delaware is really tiny. Gotcha. Well, last month we took you back to uh, Communicore West, and uh, we got a couple listeners wrote in with uh, a lot of different memories over there. And uh, I think our first uh, uh, listener mail, uh, the bag was pretty full. JT, you ran out there. But our first listener mail actually uh, had something about Communicore West, correct? Uh, yeah, it did. This is from Doug Skinner. Uh, Doug Skinner said, Hello, Retro WDW crew. Your episode 42 recap of Earth Station and Communicore West brought back some great memories of trips to Epcot in the late 80s. I love the animated preview of the pavilions in Earth Station and wish there was video footage available online. I vid- vividly remember the World of Motion logo rolling past the circular screens. I also remember something that I think was called the Family Phone Booth in Communicore, which would make sense as part of the future comms section based on your recap. This was a glass booth that was set up like a giant speakerphone. My brother, mom, and I all stood inside of it and called my grandparents in Pennsylvania, Delaware's bodyguard, with the novelty that we could all talk at the same time. I was not yet 10 at the time, so I don't remember any of the details, like if the call was free or you had to pay for it or length or anything like that. Do you know of any other information uh, related to this attraction, or do you remember it? I do remember it, and I'm, I'm going to... How I know you remember it as well. I'm gonna. I can't believe we forgot to mention it. I know, and I have a photo of it, and I'm I'm gonna dig that out here as you're describing it. So it was it was a speakerphone. It was it was actually a giant, like about five or six foot tall. It was huge, <laughs> giant plastic telephone. It looked it looked like a a current AT and T telephone that they sold at the time. And yeah, you would get into this little booth, and uh, you know what? I can't remember. It must have been free because I can't imagine how you would have like put in a calling no, card. Or no, something you did. To... Take a look at the picture. You actually, I did use it, and you could oh, okay. use your calling card. You could also swipe ah, your credit card through it. Okay. I, I love the sign at the bottom to place call. Press buttons gently, and it even had a number. Maybe we should call this. Hello, this is Bill Koontz with Disney Vacation Club, and I'm not available to take your call right now. But if you leave me a message, I'll get back to you as soon as possible. And I hope you have a magical day. <laughs> no way. There you so, go. So they just basically took an extension 
and and tapped it in, which is still being used. I wonder if he has that giant phone in his office, and that's what he does all of his. Phone <laughs> we need to call on. him. <laughs> wait, wait. We'll have to call him live. We'll have to figure out how to do that during the day and say the reason we're calling you is. And when you dial, do you press the buttons on your phone gently? <laughs> But I, I love the fact that, you know, you could give out that number and somebody would call you there if you didn't want to use your credit card. So I really wish that guy has that sitting in his DVC office or something. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he has no idea that the havoc we could wreak upon uh, yeah, him. Yeah. So, so yeah, the, at least I'm, I'm glad we took a photo of it. That was from 1998. So how do you remember what, how, how long it was? It was during the earth station years, I assume, um, obviously with AT&T sponsor, but yeah, I remember using it. I remember putting the credit card in dialing. So it was originally in Futurecom, mm-hmm. And then when earth station got redone and it became the global neighborhood, yeah. the phone actually got moved over into that section. Uh, okay. So, so it, it, it lived a long time. Now, how tall was that? Like what's the height? Easily it was, five, six feet, somewhere in there. Yeah, it was pretty big. That's crazy. It's it's. Yeah, you just walked in and you're like, that is a damn big phone. Yeah. <laughs> Why is there an on-off button? Was that the hang-up? Yeah, that was your... It was pretty much that's what it was. Okay, so I was able to zoom in. Calls may be billed to AT&T cards, major credit cards, collect, and third party. Uh, it does not accept money. To place a call, including locally, press on. So there's your answer. Um, pass a card through the slot, magnetic strip up. <laughs> <laughs> and dial zero, the area code telephone number, and to pre- hang up, press off. And then I think the flash kind of uh, uh, blurred out all of the, the fees and everything like that. So there's your answer, JT. That's crazy to me. Yeah. W- were they thinking everybody would have one of those in their home someday? Was that the <laughs> kind right. of vision of the future? Uh, someday you will have right. this along with a computer to control everything. Uh, so, so where was Zuck Skinner from? Well, that's from Doug Skinner. Thanks, Doug, for writing. Uh, Doug's from Haddonfield, New Jersey, wherever that may be. New Jersey? New Jersey, I you did say? I say Haddonfield, New Jersey. Haddonfield? I want to say something about New Jersey. Uh, Haddonfield, uh, we have deep, deep family roots there. My, my, my dad's cousins, there are many of them. They're an established Haddonfield institution. So hello to the Carmody family. And uh, my my brother in law is from Haddonfield, yeah. and his whole family's from Haddonfield. So it's a it's a little hamlet over there, a uh, lovely charming little town in a lovely charming little garden state. There we so, go. Shout out to all you guys in Haddonfield. Do they know there Doug? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Doug might know that's some right. of them. If you do, swing on over and tell them I said hi. Now that's and you know why? Because it's a small world after all. <laughs> It, it is a it is. small world. After I that. bet everybody in Haddonfield could probably get around that phone and talk at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not that small. Oh, okay. <laughs> Next up. Hello. Just wanted to say that I absolutely love the show and that the last episode triggered a fond memory related to all places, Earth Station. My family happened to be visiting Epcot during the 1984 Olympics, and the big monitors at Earth Station, the ones that usually showed the pixelated trailers for future world attractions, were actually showing the live broadcast from Los Angeles. So we were right there watching an Earth Station live when Mary Lou Retton scored her perfect tens. I imagine that showing non-Epcot content on those monitors was extremely rare occurrence, but I'm curious if y'all have ever heard of that being done during presidential debates or anything like that. Love the show. Keep up the great work. I think that's so cool. I wonder if what Mary Lou Retton looks pixelated, right? Because this did they <laughs> I wonder if they covered the screens how, right? Because we talked about how the screens were Yeah, you would have had to take that stuff off. I, that's impre- I I never personally saw any of that, so that's yeah. the coolest thing. If if the listeners have any memories of other times that that happened please send it in because that's that sounds really nifty and that, yeah it's pretty cool i mean the 84 olympics were a big deal being hosted here in los angeles and yeah well, but but we should probably in general mention because we we sound like old guys sometimes when when yeah you do if you're if yeah if you're jt's age or younger you have no idea what a gigantic deal the olympics mm-hmm. used to be every oh, four yeah. years when there were only three networks, one network would get it and broadcast it. You'd only see what they were showing you. And like the world stopped for two weeks and people worried about like who was winning the badminton and like the, whatever. You didn't was going- get any of this, the, you know, the stuff ahead of time. Now we get it on our Twitter feed, you know, oh, so-and-so got the gold. It's not even as exciting as, you know, that, right. it, it, you watched. So, so you didn't get that. 
And you also did not, it was not this incessant storytelling or anything like that. But, Just the sports. You know, so you didn't get all, it well it was the sport and you'd get like a little bit of that in there from the, from the, but all the bio pieces and the build yep. up and the, like you didn't know these people unless you were a follower of the specific sport. Right. But the other thing was, and you see it now, but it's so commonplace back then. The cross promotion. I mean, you would see it at McDonald's, and every everybody had an Olympic commercial and Olympic keepsakes. And uh, w- uh, sometime, well, I'm sure we'll talk about the uh, the eagle that for the '84 mm-hmm. Olympics that was designed that has roots with Disney. And remember, uh, remember when you would win, like if if America won gold, you would get French fries. At oh McDonald's. yeah, yeah, because they were golden <laughs> <Yes>. fries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so, so that that's like a little nice aside, I guess we should, yeah. you know, mention that for for the wayback machine here, yep. and it's like just how gigantic the Olympics. Well, on top were. of it too, being in America too, that was even bigger yet. So that's yeah, why they were. I, I was it, just gonna say, I wonder if they did it for the Sarajevo Winter Olympics that were in '84 as well. So I don't know. So that was from KJ. Uh, thank you for that message, KJ. Very good. Um, all right. Next up, I'm currently listening to episode 19 about the Living Seas, and it reminded me of a story. This is great. I love yeah, this, this is, story. Yeah, this is a good one. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, my mother, father, and I were having dinner at the Coral Reef. A waiter accidentally dropped soup on my father's lap. Just, oh, uh, what what kind Ow. do you guys think it was? Lobster bisque? <laughs> I'm thinking a chowder. 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 It wasn't chicken noodle. Something <laughs> nice mulligatawny. Something heavy and thick and hearty because the, you know, the, the Coral Reef's a classy restaurant, you know, so it's a good soup. Manager came out immediately apologizing. Besides a free meal, they hand my father a tablecloth to drape over his lap. They took his pants and they immediately sent them to cleaning. After my parents look at each other like this guy was nuts, he slipped off his own pants and handed them over. And before he finished his earth day... And he didn't even work there. (laughs) (laughs) He didn't, and they must have been the same exact size because hopefully he was a little bigger because they are baggy. Uh, And before we finished dessert, they arrived with his freshly cleaned and pressed pants. It's a service I doubt that would be offered today. What, what are you guys' thoughts on that? Is that the is that the old I Disney love. way that we miss nowadays? Is well, that I'll tell you what. Pop? I'm bringing a small piece of fishing line and I'm going to hook it up to a cup of chowder on the next Just to trip. Test down. this out. We'll test it down. <laughs> so, did the waiter take his pants off and expose his underwear in the middle of the restaurant? I'm, I'm while pit, covering? Do you remember? Do you remember when Monty Python did live at the Hollywood <laughs> Bowl and came out and you know, all in their waiter outfits, and then when they turned around, they were none, none of them were wearing pants. <laughs> That that's what I'm envisioning right now is that waiter walking around bareback. <laughs> he just, I, that's just hilarious to me. That's so good. Like just, it's like I imagine this all unfolding so quickly. And like, wait, those are his pants. Wear them. He make you know. It's just awesome. What amazing Disney service. It it really is. It really is. That's what you get when you eat at the Coral Reef back in the '80s and '90s. Uh, so thank you, Joe Barlow. And uh, if you have any other crazy stories like this, we love hearing these. These are just such good little little anecdotes for the show that was a great email god Thanks, bless joe we appreciate that made made our month getting that all right uh totally love the podcast would love to know if you guys recall the eastern airlines travel kiosk at if you had wings he's trying to settle an argument with his brother during a trip in the 70s my father decided to extend our wdw vacation your dad's legit, Eric, and used the kiosk <laughs> to change our return Eastern flight after getting off the ride. My brother, who is younger, is adamant that this did exist at the ride, and I'm confident there was an Eastern flight deck inside the attra- desk inside the attraction. Am I remembering this correctly? He says, keep up the awesome work. He loves uh, if you had wing shirt from the site. So Eric Hiles, uh, what do you guys know about the Eastern Airlines travel kiosk? Yeah, that's that's real. We actually talked about that. On our show, there was a, a desk and I think a couple of offices right at the exit of the ride. You could, I can actually remember cruising by and there was there was this phone that was on the desk that was actually the shape of an airplane that had that was white that had sort of like the Eastern Airlines stripes on it. So yeah, that was that was real. You could absolutely do that. And uh, nice, like you said, like mad props for a guy who like just extends the vacation right then and there on a whim at the end of a ride. Yeah, that's. <laughs> 
it must have been a good trip because that never happened to me. It was like, we got to get out of here. <laughs> see, did your parents ever ride if you had wings? That's that's what you need to do. Uh, it was dream flight at that point. Oh, uh, yeah. see, yeah. sorry. Mm-hmm. That's that's how good if you had wings was. Although we did They're get like, the things on the door back in the the '90s that said like, "Would you like to add more days to your trip?" Those were the, the thing. It seemed like. All right. So thanks, Eric. We appreciate that message. Um, this is a quick one from Andy. He says, occasionally you've referenced an old Birnbaum Disney guides. I'm curious to know how long Birnbaum has been publishing Disney guidebooks. Um, you guys probably know the exact dates, but when I looked it up, I was surprised when Birnbaum actually died. Like it was yes. way, way before <laughs> yes. uh, I expected. Like I expected like in recent years, but his name lived on for uh-huh. a long time. Correct. He started publishing the the first guide was done in 19, um, 1983 for for Disney World, uh, and there, he was doing some other stuff, uh, some official guides for Disneyland as well. But when Epcot came along, is when he got involved uh, with Walt Disney World. So you folks are going to need That's a book. Right. You know, so it's... it is still published to to this day in his name. He did pass away in uh, nineteen ninety one, actually. Uh, so it's been quite a, quite a while since he's been gone. But I know his his wife got involved in the publishing uh, after his passing. And um, it's like I said, it's still in his name. You can get the 2018 uh, Walt Disney World Guide, and I, I have a fond, you know, a fiction. Um, I have a fond memory of the 1986 one, which is the one that I reference the most because it was the first uh, real travel guide I sat down and read, and, and really used it to study at Walt Disney World. And I, he wrote a lot of things kind of tongue in cheek, and 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 also too, I think he was very very honest in in his uh, descriptions. Uh, and you, as you've mentioned. You know, we do reference it now and then because some of the stuff is amazing, like stop and smell the flowers in the breezeway or, uh, you know, you'll be amazed at the touch screens and such like that. So the uh, the and the pre-internet, you know, before because even when the Internet was around in the early days, it wasn't loaded up with all these fan sites and travel sites and things like that. It was mostly official stuff and people posting pictures of their cat or the history of their, <laughs> of their tires on their car or something. Uh, but back then in the nineties, like I, you know, my, th- those are my first trips as an adult and I used the burn bomb guides. I mean, I would go out and buy them. And if I was taking nieces or nephews or something, I would buy them the guide as like a present before we, before we went so they could read it. But the guide is how I learned about Tonga toast, which we never stayed at the Polynesian. So I wouldn't have known about it. And the, the like the guide's tip was like, hey, you can also get it at the boat rights in that the Port Orleans. You can get it for breakfast there too. And they called it something mm-hmm. else. And so there were like things like that in that book that I vividly remember reading. And I also remember them reading like they recommended in every guide multiple times to see Hoop to do review. And uh, how and I finally took their advice That's last right. year. That's right. <laughs> a couple, it took a while. A couple decades in the making. Years. Put off for 25 yeah. years, but we, we, we got, got there. That's, there, was no, there was no Disney food blog back then. There was no instant review on a drink on four mediums or anything. It was like you went to the library and you, you checked that book out or you bought it. That was actually like my souvenir for years when I would, the, the kid's guide was out. Like I would get the new one at Disney, read it the whole drive home, and then it was, we've talked about it before, it was groundbreaking to me when the Disney World Explorer CD-ROM came out because it all came to life, actually, for once, you know, just looking at different things that you'd never seen before. So, I, uh, And I of, will add, if, if you know, if you're looking for a great historical read, um, pick up one of the old guides, 1984, 85, 86, somewhere in there, because uh, it's really fun to sit down and read the descriptions and it is a trip back in time. Um, you know, rather than maybe reading some of these personal accounts or some of these historical books we've talked about in the past, it's a, it's a really a neat way to, to research and, and to look at the way that the, you know, the park was. Some of it bums you out too. Cause you're like, that sounds really cool. Is that still around? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but listen to episode 23 for that. We'll explain it all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. got two more here real quick. Uh, greetings. I was looking through your wonderfully designed t-shirts on T public. I had a question about the Walt Disney world railroad graphic. Was there a station in Tomorrowland at one time? I know Disneyland had a station there, but can find no information regarding the station at the magic kingdom. Thanks, Johnny. Oh man. The Tomorrowland station. It's a thing. So, it was supposed to be yeah. a thing. Oh, okay. So if, if you look at the early renderings of Tomorrowland, there's that great one that's done f- sort of like from a bird's eye view that I think was a Colin Campbell piece, and you can actually see the railroad station there. So it, it was actually planned from the beginning 
It didn't it didn't make the 1971 cut. And then they actually poured the foundation for it as part of the Space Mountain Foundation. But then after the gas crunch, they were looking to save as much money as possible and they just just didn't put it in. Uh, and then as time went on, they ended up building, you know, the birthday land station. And I guess they just decided they didn't need it anymore. Um, it, the remnants of it was actually there right up until them, uh, when they built that arcade, the like power and light station arcade in Tomorrowland. It's like, you could still walk down into the area, uh, where it was supposed to be. So yeah, it's, it's a shame. We, we, we never got it. We were supposed to. That just didn't happen. You got a sweet arcade, though. <laughs> <laughs> we did, or whatever's left <laughs> yeah, of it. Yeah, whatever's left of it. All right, so thank you so much to all our writers and uh, listeners. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, send us a message, podcast at retrowdw.com. All right, so as a reminder, uh, we just wanted to make sure that everybody is aware that the tickets are still on sale for the 2018 Lake and Lagoon Tour Discovery Edition. Uh, that's coming up uh, November uh, 17th, 2018. That's a Saturday, and hoping to see a lot of people out there. Uh, for those of you new to the podcast or, or haven't heard us talk about before, uh, we've been able to charter a former uh, attraction boat from uh, the Animal Kingdom, the Discovery River Cruise Boats, uh, to be precise. And we ha- we'll have a Disney captain along as we take you on about an hour or so cruise around Bay Lake, uh, Seven Seas Lagoon, pointing out all the different uh, things that were there and used to be there and things that happened and stories and might even have some special guests along the way. And um, on top of that, everybody will be getting a, uh, a special gift that we've been working on and Jason's been working on as well. And you guys have seen we're probably about, what, 70% complete with it. What, what do you think so far? I, I didn't think we could top the fountain <laughs> at Epcot. But while this is a different kind of gift... I think it's going to blow more people's yeah. minds. Yeah. Uh, I would have to agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Every time I see another update, I'm just like, wow. <laughs> Coming from how, too. That's big, big praise right there in the, the style <laughs> that the, the gift is. Now, it would, yeah. would be really impressive if we only gave him like four weeks to do it, but he does have a lot of time. So. <laughs> but, yes. But uh, Still. So, so that is looking amazing, and uh, all four of us, uh, including Jason as well, um, have been involved. We've The four of us have been giving him you know, hints and ideas and tips, and uh, I think you're really going to be impressed at it. So uh, that comes along with, with the ticket. Um, tickets have almost sold out. There's only a handful left. Uh, in fact, I think some boats only have one or two spots left. So uh, best to, to get your ticket in, uh, ticket sales taken care of. Uh, <clears throat> Get your ticket purchase taken care of as soon as possible. So you can go right to RetroWDW.com, and on the right-hand side, you'll see the Lake and Lagoon Tour Discovery Edition logo. Just click that, and you'll be taken to the ticket purchase page. All right, well, it's time to get into the audio rewind portion of the show. Um, How you picked this one out because you wanted it to be easier, and uh, in actuality, what you did is you flooded our inboxes as a result. That's right. Man. So uh, let's first take a look. I just want people to win, man. What's wrong with that? <laughs> All right. So you, you'll choose this month's as well. And it'll be... He's got a storage building full of vinyl to give away. He's got to get it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So let's take a listen to last month's Audio Rewind. All right. So if you guessed the Space Mountain Tunnel, you are 100% correct. And I I tell you, I think just about every single person that wrote in got it, got it correct. And we got almost everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I think we got more entries this month than we did for the last two months combined to give you an idea, which was, was amazing. So the thing is, I'm it's, it's not like it's the most obscure thing in the world, but I'm really surprised how many people not only recognize it, but just mentioned how much they love that music. Yeah. Like we have people falling to sleep to it and like, (laughs) I, uh, so so not only did we get emails from probably a half dozen people who are like, oh, that's the ringtone on my phone. I had two friends tell me, I hear that every day. It's the ringtone on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. There's a uh, one of the, the music apps that they have a specific channel that just plays that all the time. Like just oh really on a loop. Yeah. So I was I actually knew that one because it's. I did think the people that emailed us and said they danced to it at their wedding were weird. <laughs> first dance <laughs> yeah. 
All right. Well, hopefully our winner this month, that wasn't them, but uh, it is Jenny Buchanan. So congratulations, Jenny. We'll be getting the uh, 1993 souvenir brochure from the World of Motion out to you. Uh, and then brings up, uh, we need a prize for this month. We, uh, how you've got something for this, for this month for the prize. I do. I do. I have, I have, <laughs> I grabbed a stack of these when, when, it, when the energy exchange was closing down. So <laughs> and they're still looking for him to this day. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, where's, where'd that guy go? So, so I have another copy of the, uh, the very well-known comic book of, of Mickey and Goofy visit the universe of energy. Nice. Stars, stars many dinosaurs and, and you know, those lovable, those lovable characters, Mickey and Goofy. That's as right. They find out all about what makes the world go round. And that can be yours if you know the answer to this month's Audio Rewind. Who's seen a clown? I've seen the face of a witch. Uh, I see a lion jumping through a hole. Uh, I see a beautiful fish flying. I see the face of a funny clown. All right, if you think you know the answer to this month's Audio Rewind, send your guesses to contest at retro wdw.com notice that's a different email we're kind of sorting things out a little differently so make sure that you send it to contest at retro wdw.com all entries are due by october 15th 2018 and we'll pick one random person from all correct entries to win this month's prize and as always we need to add something to the prize pot um, i've got something to add so jt run down the last two months worth and we'll throw something in the big pot July, we have a sewing kit from Disney World, and in August, we have the official Walt Disney World Disneyland vinyl LP record album, new sealed in the package. There we go. Well, we had a listener send in an item for the prize pot this month. Uh, We'd like to give a thank you and a shout out to Matt Fussfield. We've met him a couple times. He's a big listener of the show. Hey, hey, where's Matt live? Is he from Jersey? He is from New Jersey. Yeah. Recurring theme. And uh, Brian, you'll be happy. You know, I, I made for breakfast this week for the family. Pork this roll? Week. Pork roll sandwiches, English muffin, little cheese and egg. Delicious. So for those of you who don't know pork roll, look it up. But does, out. does that have anything to do with New Jersey? Just so you know, the northern half of New Jersey calls it Taylor ham. Ham, yes. And the southern half of New Jersey and most of Pennsylvania calls it pork roll. Right. I it's grew up right in the thing. middle, so I, I kind of got both. It's delicious. It is. It's a It's a processed pork salty meat breakfast yes it's like an egg mcmuffin no it 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 it, <laughs> it well yeah i mean it's on the lines it's a it's a mixture of like between canadian bacon and spam somewhere in between those two and almost a salami yeah it's cut yeah, thick. it's really it's really delicious <laughs> look up sorry just, sorry this just gets more fascinating the more you talk about it <laughs> Howard, Howard, on my winter trip this year, I promise I will bring a package of Taylor Ham. Actually, I, I want to say some of my Orlando friends said they can get it in their Taylor Publix Ham? down there or something. Yeah, and generally they do sell it, but they sell it in the large log, and you have to slice it yourself. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, wait so. a second. Is it like is that the brand or the like? The... So the, the brand is called Taylor Ham, but the product is called Pork Roll. And as Brian pointed out, d- depending on, you know, what – your demographic is, uh, you know, your actual location in, uh, I'm going to have to check my grocer's freezer and see. It's like the fascinating <laughs> difference between people who call water fountains bubblers. Right. Yeah. There was one is... state that called it that I saw. Yeah. It was like Wisconsin. No, no, no. It. There's more states that like, there's a whole region of the country that calls them bubblers. You don't That's call right. it a drinking fountain? No, they call no. it a water fountain. Water there fountain. is a drinking fountain <laughs> section too. Yeah. 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 Now, Brian, one important pork roll question. Uh, yes, when you purchase yours, do you purchase, is it the eight or the four? I do the thin slice, the you eight. You do the I eight as the well, the eight, yes. Eight, eight what? Eight ounces? <laughs> no, eight slices. Eight slices. You get the box with eight slices How or thick four. are these slices we talking? An eighth inch, well, if quarter it's a inch? Well, fo- if it's four, they're thicker. They're twice the, the thickness of the eights. I prefer the eights. I'd rather have two thin slices than, yes. than one thick slice. It's more surface area for the searing of the meat, so... Um, maybe, maybe we have to have, uh, at, uh, one, we should have like a breakfast, a breakfast event down there where Todd and I just cook up pork roll and eggs for everybody. Exactly. And for the vegetarians, we'll see if there's a, like a tofu pork roll. Can, they can right. have maple syrup and pancakes. We know there where we to get go. The Todd makes the maple syrup. Yeah. yeah. I'll bring that down. 
So a big thank you to Matt Fussfield for adding. So what did he add? He sent to us the D23 gold member gift from this year, which is the, the Mickey Whoa. Mouse kit with all the different Mickey Mouse uh, souvenirs and reproductions and stuff. So he sent that. Uh, so a big thank you to Matt for sending that to us. And that's going to go into the prize pot. And for those of you who don't know, what are you, you're asking what the prize pot is? At the end of this year, we're going to draw from all entries in the audio rewinds, rewinds whether they're correct or not. We'll draw one name to receive the giant prize pot in December 2018. So again, if you know the, the answer to this month's Audio Rewind, send your guesses to contest at retrowdw.com. So before we move into our main topic, Todd and the boys here, I would like mm-hmm. to take a moment to talk about uh, one of my oldest friends who's also been a listener of the show from day one and participated in making possible all of our events He was a boat captain on our first Lake and Lagoon tour and contributed a lot of stuff uh, for our displays at Epcot 35 and helping us make that event actually occur by doing a lot of the AV stuff that we did that night. Anyway, my friend Rob, uh, who many of our fans uh, who've met us have met, uh, tomorrow will mark a month that he has been in the hospital. And an otherwise healthy guy uh, was rushed to the ICU and uh, turned out he had severe bleeding ulcers uh, and one that they didn't catch for a couple of days because of where it was. But uh, he's been in the ICU for, uh, as I said, it'll be a month tomorrow that he's been in the hospital. And I got a text actually from his brother just as we started recording tonight that he is out of the ICU and they've moved him into a regular room. And uh, today, for the first time in a month, he had solid food. Uh, So uh, not a lot of it because he's got a long road to recovery still. But uh, all things being equal, he should be out of the hospital in the next week or so. And that is uh, extremely encouraging because it was a scary month. And and, uh, I, I, I shared it with some folks on Twitter a while back and I know some folks wrote to him and we got some nice uh, emails and messages from from our fans so thank you to everybody for your good thoughts and wishes on uh, for him and I know he'll hear this because uh, once he gets out of there and before he goes back to work he's got a lot of he's got a month of the outside world to catch up on including the retro WDW podcast so uh, I don't know if he'll be with us in November um, at the uh, at the lake and lagoon tours but uh you know it's good to hear that he's on the mend and and i think i speak on all of our behalfs when we say get well soon rob and i know that rob would love this month's topic all right as the music indicates how is going to lead us in a trip back in time to the days at the disney mgm studios when you could play a game show maybe see a game show set as I got to see as I walked through and didn't get to see anything filming as usual um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, the wheel was sitting there but there was no fortunes to be had um, but how you've, you've done your research I know we've got some interviews to talk about and uh, there was a lot going on there in the early years of when it was a working studio and it even uh, towards the end got some of the uh, you know, visitors and, and attendees involved as well Yes, that's right, and and I want to thank Kevin Lively for for suggesting this show. Uh, he was he was knocked out when he found out that one of these things went on, so uh, it felt like a good good thing to do is to wrap all this stuff together. So, uh, so tonight, since we're doing a game show, I thought we'd make it a little fun for uh, for the other hosts. I'm going to ask some questions. They they haven't seen. They've been put into soundproof booths and our show notes have been wiped out so they have no idea they might have some idea because they were there get your fingers on but, the buzzers boys yeah you know, like yeah <laughs> but but as we go into each one of these shows it's like i'm, I'm gonna ask them uh, a question to see if they can identify the show and, and the first person to respond uh in the uh in the message area in our skype that we use to communicate with each other is, is gonna get called on so are you gonna uh, give our, us a t-shirt if we yeah, we'll have surprises. I'm gonna keep keep score. Every uh, every uh, question is worth 100 points. Ooh. And uh, if if we have a tie at the end of the show, it's like then we'll we'll have a tiebreaker question. Look at this. I'm excited. Yeah. All right, we're ready so, to go. All right. So, uh, first question is this: What TV game show set was a copy of Burt Reynolds' living room? 
So Todd, what do you what do you think the answer is? Win, lose, or draw. That you <laughs> are correct, Todd. All right, Todd gets 100 points. From the number one vacation destination in the world, the Walt Disney World Resort in Orlando, Florida, it's the game that everybody's playing. Win, lose, or draw. So uh, the very first game show that that we can find now there might have been like some special traveling ones but for for our purposes with the disney M jam studios the the very first game show that i was able to track down was win lose, or draw uh the game show was created by two burts burt reynolds and burt convicts and, and if we can feel sad for burt reynolds passing boy just this in week. time look at that yeah yeah and burt convicts passing oh did some, he also some time ago yes oh okay not this I week know that <laughs> <laughs> if I recall correctly, not to bring the show down, but uh, Bert Convy had a brain tumor at a relatively young age. Oh, okay. Well, that's too so, bad. So rest in peace, Bert Convy. And Bert Reynolds. And Bert Reynolds. Yes. Yeah, all the Berts. So in, in 1988, uh, they took the show out on a road trip, filming episodes in Hawaii, Central Park, and New York City, and Walt Disney World. So some episodes were filmed at Epcot Center in front of the World Showcase Lagoon, at the Polynesian Resort out on the beach, which is very nice, and also inside the newly opened studios at, at Disney MGM. Now, now, the thing that I did not realize is that the filming studios were actually open 10 months prior to the park. So there was oh, really? a yeah. lot of work being done uh, there uh you know, prior to the theme park opening. A lot of Bette Midler movies. I was going to say, you had to shoot the lottery. That's right. That's right. So, uh, does anybody remember, did you watch the show? Do you remember the premise of the program? Anyone? It was similar to charades, but only done on paper with pen instead. And I believe you couldn't say anything, so they'd give you a clue, like you, you French fries, for instance. You had and to draw you would, it. And it's you had to dr right, draw it and try to get them to say the, the phrase or the object, and, and you couldn't use your mouth. You couldn't use emotions or, or gestures as opposed to charades I, I, I very cool. it was very popular those the home yeah game yeah too. i think pictionary was the mm. i don't know if that happened before i'm not sure which drew off of which but i could remember going to people's houses and like p playing pictionary and things too so categories right. yes <laughs> and scruples remember scruples the game is a question of scruples your friend set you up with a blind date he's not exactly what you had in mind do you go through with it on what? Oh, whether or not he sees me first. Oh. Hey, what if he's got a great mind? Yeah. You go out with his mind. Hey, looks aren't everything. Prove it. You married him, didn't you? A question of scruples from Milton Bradley. It's a game and more. I remember a lot of Lynn Loser Draw games ended with the person hammering the marker on the board, like, you know, like, <laughs> right here, here's what I'm talking about. And there's like lots of dots from them. <laughs> <clears throat> so interesting here how is that win loser draw um was uh, presented by originally in 1987 uh by vicky lawrence and burr convoy as we talked about uh and pictionary was also a game show in 1989 believe it or oh not. So, so um that came first okay yeah so so <clears throat> so win loser draw came first and there was um pictionary was you had uh uh you had 60 seconds to draw as many pictures on a telestrator for your teammates as possible so it didn't have the marker the squeaky mm, marker on the white okay pad. okay so it's probably a little bit different but the, the, the concept of drawing something that the other people didn't know was was uh you know was gotcha different. and the, now uh, vicky lawrence did the daytime version so she never got to go to disney mgm uh, okay. at least not for this so bird convy did the the nighttime version right right and the amazing thing is when those draw 585 episodes that it ran, yeah, a long time. I didn't realize very, it very much so. Time. Longer yeah. than Bert Convy. Well, and then longer <laughs> than Pictionary with a whopping sixty-five. So yeah, there not, you go. not so good. Uh, so the contestant would be paired with two celebrity guests. So there were two teams. So it would be two celebrities and then one regular person who is playing. Uh, and and then, like you said, it's like they would get a clue and they would have to draw it up on the board, and then you would have to guess what the hell they were drawing. One of our listeners, Jeff Norix sent me a YouTube link to the episode that was shot at the Polynesian. And I we will share this with everybody because the opening is absolutely hilarious. So picture this, uh, Bert Convy with Tigger, the costume Tigger character, on a catamaran <laughs> being pulled by a water sprite. Oh, that's legit. <laughs> into the beach. 
uh, at the Polynesian, and the person in the ticker costume is is actually steering the catamaran, or at least <laughs> pretending to. So as he gets close up to the shore, which is there's maybe what like three feet of water there, mm-hmm. Bert Convy jumps off of the boat uh, to wade up to the shore. He turns to wave goodbye to Tigger, just completely going with the bit. Somehow loses his footing and just falls completely into the water. <laughs> is he in like the host suit, like it, like, a, or is he in like a bathing suit? He was in like shorts, okay. yeah, sort of like a '80s Hobie outfit. Fortunately, and he wasn't mic'd yet because they were just using handheld, so it's like he didn't get electrocuted or anything. But and when he gets up, you can tell he's just really pissed. <laughs> he's so bad that this happened. Uh, and as as he's walking up to the shore, the celebrity guests Mark Price and Clifton Davis like pull him up onto the shore, and he's just sopping wet. And I think eventually they s- start handing him towels and stuff. So uh, go look at that; it is it, really it super really funny. Really begs the question: Why Tigger? Like who who decided Tigger's going to drive this boat? All Maybe the he others had big were, eye holes. That could be it. All the others were. Um, <clears throat> were an overlay that day. I mean, he really had to just sit there because the guy in the in the water sprite was doing really doing the the main driving, and there were a bunch of characters like off to the side watching. Mm. But yeah, somehow Tigger pulled the, the straw on that one. The reason that this kind of becomes important is that the syndicated version of the show was distributed by Buena Vista Television. So later on, this Buena Vista TV connection will suddenly become a lot more important for all of the things. Somehow, mysteriously, everything distributed by Buena Vista Television mostly ends up getting shot at the studios. So, yeah. So how long? So you said that ran for how many episodes, Todd? Uh, it was 585. 585. But we only got a handful, probably like a week's worth of episodes shot at Disney M- MGM. But that was that was a good start. It's kind of like the Mike Douglas show. You know, you got a week and that was it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. In and out. In and out. So uh, so now we're going to move up to September of 1988, and now we're going to get a full season of a game show shot uh, at the studio. So everybody, get your hands on your buzzers, put in your put okay. in your letters, get ready to go. Okay. And the question is, what TV game show launched the careers of comedians Colin Quinn, Dennis Leary, and Adam Sandler? Ah, <laughs> oh, I got Brian. Whose line is it anyway? Sorry, oh, incorrect. Oh, no. All right, Todd. It was uh, the the name escapes me. The MTV one with them oh. sitting in the couch. Can I buzz in again? All right. Yes. Remote control. Oh, oh yes. That's it. Remote control. Uh, Kenny wasn't like the other kids. Remote control. TV mattered. Nothing else did. Girl said yes. Benice said no. Now he's got his own game show! That's right, alright. So Brian, we're good. Brian's got 100 points. So right now, Brian's got 100. And Todd's got 100. Alright. <laughs> Couldn't close the no, deal. I, I, no, I knew, I knew what I meant. I you just, just called, said the wrong... <laughs> I just said the wrong show. So, uh, Remote Control was MTV's... Uh, first non-musical program and the game show was a hit on the music network that ran from 1987 to 1990 are you saying they played music on that channel <laughs> they, you, can you believe it there was a time <laughs> this started the downfall right here yeah. yeah this is the start of yeah next thing we have is jersey shore with the pork sandwiches and the whole deal is. <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to remember what the other wasn't there another game show I, I thought it was remote I th- control I think and they, maybe one they, other one. They did have another one, yeah. Eventually, they did Rock and Roll Jeopardy. Well, that was on VH1, and 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 I used to watch that nonstop. Uh, Je- uh, Jeff Probst was the host, and I was very good at Rock and Roll Jeopardy, but I va- vividly remember remote control. So the show, the premise of the show was that host Ken Ober wanted to be a game show host so badly that he turned his basement into a makeshift TV studio and then would invite people over to be contestants on the show. And the set was, in fact, designed to look like a basement and had a washer and a dryer in it. And oh, that's a cool. A bunch of stuff. Yeah. Was, so JT, you never saw it, but it no. sounds like Todd. Todd oh, yeah. Ryan, you, they would you set, set in the Lazy Boys. I remember when they would get the answer wrong. They would, they would dump them into the bit further down the pit or something. The Lazy Boys would eject them. I can't remember what yep, it was. Yep, that's... <laughs> That's pretty accurate. Um, although the show was typically shot in New York City, 
Season three of the show was taped at the Disney m M&M Studios in Studio Two for two months, beginning in November of 1988, while the show Superboy was being shot in Studio One. So that kind of gives you a... Can you imagine, like, Superboy over here and then, like, remote control, like, right next to it? Very yeah. hell of a dressing room <laughs> debacle. <laughs> and, and, yeah, so Colin Quinn, Kerry Wurr, and Steve Treecastle, the musical guy, uh, like, and the writing staff, they were all in Orlando for the production of the show. And um, actually found a YouTube video. There was a guy who was working as the, uh, as the cue card man for the show. Uh, and he actually has a couple of videos on YouTube of, of sort of, like, behind the scenes uh, of filming an episode. So we'll, uh, we'll make sure to, to get that out so everyone can see that. It's pretty entertaining. So, uh, so that's September, 1988. Uh, so they're in for two months and then they're, they're gone. And then it's time for another show to, to come in. So get ready, get your hands on your buzzers. JT may actually have the lead on this and we'll see. Oh boy. Uh, okay. So what TV game show used announcers from the Mickey Mouse Club? Uh, All right, JT. Teen win, lose, or draw? Yes. Wow. You know why all these kids are in Mark Price's driveway? They're about to play America's favorite quick draw game. So grab your mother's lawn chair and drag it on over. It's time for Teen Win, Lose, or Draw! Uh, that's because I actually watched this one. <laughs> oh, good. So, in, uh, by 1989, the Disney Channel was looking for original programming, and the studios at Disney and Jam were just cranking out episodes of the Mickey Mouse Club and Adventures in Wonderland. You guys... Like vaguely, do you remember Adventures in Wonderland, JT? No, I don't. No, oh, okay. Well, that was an educational show, so we will not talk about. That. <laughs> I didn't watch educational TV. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Buena Vista Television was distributing the popular adult version of Win Loser Draw in syndication. So, I guess someone must have thought it would be a good idea to make a version of Kids to run on the Disney Channel. Uh, on Teen Win Loser Draw, the show was hosted by Mark Price. Um, who not coincidentally appeared as a celebrity on the episode of Win, Lose, or Draw that was filmed at the Polynesian that we just Ooh, talked about. Ah. Uh, so he must have impressed them with his his talent during that time. Now, does anybody remember what role Mark Price was famous for on TV? I just know him as the Cavs basketball player, but that's not the same Mark Price. Different Mark Price. Nobody, nobody. Okay, he was Skippy. Erwin Skippy oh, Handler Erwin on Family Handler. Ties. <clears throat> on Family Ties, yes. So that show wound down towards the end of 1988. Uh, Mark actually had been doing stand-up since he was 14 years old. Huh. His dad was Borscht Belt comedian Al ben- Benny. Is that or Beanie, B-E-N-I-E? Okay. I don't know if that name brings a bell with anybody. Uh, and, and he had been a part of his dad's act from the age of seven. So uh, he was very, very experienced. And you could tell it's like he's he's just a natural at doing this. Uh, he still does stand up today. So it's uh, he's out there. Um, and some and of... no one calls him Mark Price today. Everyone still calls him Skippy. <laughs> Skippy, yeah. <laughs> um, so some of the celebrities that appeared on the show, Tina Yothers, also from Family Ties. Family mm-hmm. Ties. Uh, Soleil Moon Fry, who you probably remember. Oh, from... Punky. It's punky, Bruce. Oh, punky. <laughs> and of course, everyone's favorite, Will Wheaton. Will Wheaton. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. It's from from St- Star Trek's Will Wheaton. Yeah. It's Star Trek The Next Generation. Stand by me, too. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so that show aired on the Disney Channel from April 29th, 1989 to September 26, 1992. But only the first season was actually shot at Disney MGM. It was run like the adult version, except instead of having two celebrities and one contestant, they had one celebrity and two contestants. So that way they, I guess, had less celebrities that they needed to fly down to Orlando uh, to do this. And instead of looking like Burt Reynolds' living room, the set was designed to look like a backyard with the show being hosted out of a garage. Yeah, I remember that. Like it was, yeah, like in front of like a single car garage, you know, detached garage type look. Yeah, and there were kids usually in the audience. It was, you know... They didn't, I think they actually cast for like kids to come out and, and, uh, watch the show rather than having adults that were in there. It was so topical to us. We even had a, a DOS version of win, lose, or draw on our first computer. That's Excellent. How did you draw on the computer? 
or did you just you, guess? You just had to guess, I recall. I have to look it up, but I remember like you put in the, the actual floppy disk. Uh, and... I'm sure there's a full gameplay on YouTube, more than one, that you can watch at your leisure. We'll include in the show notes. Yep. <laughs> now, the grand prize for winning was uh, a trip to the U.S. Space Camp. Remember oh, when that was a big camp. deal? Now all Alabama. The game, yeah, all it's the game shows are still there. Away with one of it's the still a big deal. Yeah, Space Camp is still is there. It? And they have adult... We should all go. I, the four of us should go and attend the, the adult session. <laughs> what does that mean? They have an adult... Yeah. They have an adult... <laughs> they have an adult Space Camp. You can, it's called the Adult Space Ca- Academy. Couldn't we just go on a booze cruise or something to pretend we're pirates? I mean, we have to go to Space Camp? It's a three-day event, yeah, Todd. Five hundred and fifty dollars. Well, pretty cheap for three is, days. Is it like the movie where you get trapped <laughs> you get in space trapped, and yeah, you accidentally press? Is there a monkey what? involved? Wasn't there a monkey there, in the movie? I remember there was a robot. <laughs> I look at the packing list. The packing list is like a kid's camp checklist: closed-toed shoes, flip-flops for the shower, change for the vending machine. <laughs> I should uh, wait. There's got to be a weight limit on here. Hang on, where is it? There's, I, I gotta be. I what thought you were do? weightless in space. <laughs> what do you actually do with this thing? Just learn how to train? Like, do you actually do any physical activity, or is it all just? I, I would do. I would do a one day, Todd. But three days—that's an investment, right there. <laughs> Time. I, I don't feel like I'd get anything at the end. Why don't you just go to Mission Space, JT? Yes. We could. We could rent out Mission Space for an event. Ten graduates of Space Camp have gone on to become astronauts. Well, here's your chance. And one of them was on team win, lose, or draw. (laughs) (laughs) So the runner-up got a prize package, which probably included a Konica camera. Do you remember? (laughs) Zenith TV. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So like I said, uh, only the first season was taped at Disney M. Production on the subsequent seasons were moved to Hollywood. I don't know the exact taping dates, but it was uh, probably started in the spring of 1989. And the show wrapped just prior to the parks opening up in May. And if you were a contestant and you want a trip to space camp, we want to see your pictures. Yeah. yeah. And then to me, the highlight of the show was at the end. It's like after all the credits rolled, there was this title card showing the earful tower with the word superimposed that said like videotaped before a studio audience at the, and then the Disney MGM studios, like on the earful tower, like represented the words oh, there. Yeah. And then there was like another, like, dash in the word florida so uh, they started having this stuff like at the end of the shows to sort of promote the fact that it was it was shot there so we're definitely i have a screenshot of that we're definitely going to include that so that everyone can see that now, do you think if you were a contestant or an audience member were they like like locked down with cameras like could you take pictures in the studio audience do you think or did they like oh i can tell you during that time it's like you were not allowed to have cameras anywhere actually it's quite an anomaly that the guy that was on the staff managed to sneak in his camera because they never allowed the public to know that one of the one of the weird things about being on game shows is that you don't get paid until the show airs oh so if somehow you were to and you're supposed to you're sworn to secrecy it's like you're you're not supposed to say like whether you won or lost until your show is actually on and i and i think contractually it's like they can take the prize away from you or you probably don't you don't even actually even get the prize until later on so if if someone were to leak the results of the show it's like they would probably never air the episode mm. oh, so yeah. and that is that has happened before it's like if info got out they just don't run it and then everybody's screwed out of getting a prize so that's they, interesting yeah they would have been very very careful about that yeah. All right, so that's Teen Wizard, Teen Win Loser Draw. Uh, so we're gonna move up to June of 1990 now. So everybody, get ready. We're gonna ask another question, and here it is: What TV game show's final round is a variation of the classic Three Prisoners probability problem? Oh, Todd. I see Todd's buzzed in. I just in. gotta say, I is a Wheel of Fortune. Oh, that's that's a good guess. JT is did JT buzz in? No, no, JT did not buzz in. I'm still still at space camp. Oh, uh, Brian's. Hey, Hal, let's make yeah. a deal. Oh no, yes, that's, that's all say. right. Dang it. Behind these ever changing doors, awaits a spectacular array of cash. 
fresh, merchandise, fun, and surprises. Today, from the Disney MGM Studios in Florida, Stage 1 is packed with people from all over the world ready to play America's favorite game. Let's make a deal! I still love that. They'd be in those costumes and they'd open up one it's just a big pile of tires because they picked the wrong door. <laughs> not, 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 even, not even worth watching if it's not Monty Hall. That's so. right. Yeah. Funny, funny you say that. Um, so, the show was revived for the third time when it came to Disney MGM. Wow. Uh, Monty Hall was getting up in years, and he actually wanted to enjoy his retirement. He, he just wanted to go sailing and stuff. So, he gave up the hosting job to just become producer of the show, and he handed off all the pr actual production responsibilities to Dick Clark Productions and Ronnie Greenberg Productions, where his own production company had actually been the original one uh, that had done it. He, I think, premiered that show back in 1963. So it's like he had been involved with that for a super long time. Um, so he retired and the show was hosted by another guy named Bob Hilton, who was an announcer for game shows through the 1980s, including the Price is Right after the death of Johnny Olson. Also the lovely Carol Merrill, the show's model and assistant from 1963 to 1977, was retired and living in Hawaii. So uh, Georgia Sattel, along with the sisters Diane and Elaine I'm going to kill this last name. Klima Zaweski okay. became the show models. Now, Diane and Lane would become uh, well-known as the Coors Twins. Uh, so when the show was announced to the press, it was touted that it would be both a show and an attraction. Um, so the TV show was filmed every other week on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then during the downtime, it was turned into a show for guests to experience. Did... And you guys actually get to do this uh, in 1990. So Todd, you got you went in 89 and 90. Yeah, right? I don't I don't recall doing that. I know I did one of the other later game shows, but I I didn't participate in anything uh, previous to that. Okay, so I actually did get to I didn't get to do the real filming version, but I did go see this uh, like as an attraction. And and what they would do is uh, you'd get in line and go through the queue. Uh, and they would have uh, people come out and sort of like talk to people standing in line and see who had a good personality. And they would uh, pull contestants out of people standing in line and then give you costumes to wear since you're just in your regular tourist attire and not like dressed like a duck or anything. <laughs> um, the attraction didn't use, you know, the real show, the real show host or the real show models. It was cast members, you know, playing the parts probably from the entertainment di division. Um, but you got to actually like play through Let's Make a Deal, just like a typical show where, you know, it's like they had the little mini prizes and you would pick this thing or that thing and pick, you know, at the end, it's like you would pick behind. You'd be given the choice of like door number one or door number two or door number three. Um, the prizes were not as impressive, but I do think that the grand prize was like a couple of nights stay at a Disney hotel. Mm. So that's I mean, that's not too shabby. Probably the grand grand for Lordian or something because that had just kind of opened up. Yeah. Now so, were they uh, were they fake filming or real filming or not filming? They, I'm trying to remember if I, there were probably some cameras on because I want to say there were some video screens just within the that you could see to like see people's reactions and faces, so it gave, kind of gave you that simulation. But uh, you know, it wasn't the full blown. Obviously, it wasn't the full blown show. But like all the lights and and stuff were on. It's they tried to run it as as much of a game show as possible. They didn't stop for like commercial breaks or anything. You know, fake commercial breaks like you would have yeah, yeah. during actual filming. But like it was, it was pretty tight. Um, so taping for that show began on June fourth, nineteen ninety, in Studio One. And it ran through September of that year. And then the show actually premiered on July 9th, 1990 at the 10 a.m. slot on NBC. Um, as you pointed out, Brian, you don't want to watch it unless it's not Monty Hall. The show was not popular <laughs> <laughs> with Bob Hilton. Uh, and by October of 1990, uh, Bob Hilton left the show and Monty Hall came back to he host came the back. show. Yep. Right. So, uh, uh, but the show still only lasted the one season and ended on January 11th of 1991. So it wow. barely went, you know, six months. So it was pretty quick. Uh, and as long as we're speaking of deaths, uh, Monty Hall passed away on September 30th, 
2017. Not, oh, not super long ago. Wow. It kind of it is true, but it happened. Bob Hilton is still alive. Is he? Yes. Well, almost good. a year ago to the day of us recording this. Almost. So let's make a deal is out. And it's time for one of America's favorite family game shows to come to Disney MGM to film. So get your fingers on your buzzer. Here's the question. Uh, what game show theme song was written by Merv Griffin? Uh, Je- Jeopardy. Jeopardy. Oh, no. Todd is buzzing in. Wheel of Fortune, my friend. Wheel of Fortune! From Walt Disney World's 20th anniversary surprise celebration in Orlando, Florida, it's Wheel of Fortune Round the World, America's most watched game show. The famous wheel is spinning your way with lots of cash and an assortment of fabulous and exciting prizes. Over $174,000 just waiting to be won this week. And now, here are your host and hostess, Pat Sajak and Bella White. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, folks. See you later. Pat Sajak. Can anyone tell us why they wrote those theme songs? And people like Sherwood Schwartz would write the theme song and lyrics to things like Gilligan's Island and Brady Bunch. Can you tell me why they would do that? I think I think I know the answer to that question. So they own the rights to them. Yes, yeah. every time that's right. Every, every time it's played, they get cash. And here's a fun one, JT. Gene Roddenberry wrote lyrics to the Star Trek theme song, so he- which were never used, but he's credited. As the as a writer for that song, so he just got money from it. Wow. So they played basically like the instrumental version of his song. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And he would just what were the I lyrics like? What were they saying? I was sure it's, it's out like there Bill somewhere. Murray I was just picturing, Star Wars. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was say. Bill Murray <laughs> Star they, they, Wars. <laughs> they actually just did uh, Gilbert Gottfried's podcast last week, a mini episode on TV shows and game shows theme songs that had lyrics that you didn't know and things like the theme from the tonight show. Uh, the Paul Anka wrote the theme to the tonight show. There's a full set of lyrics and it was recorded. Like, you know, it's like we're out to get it. Like there's a, it's a, it's a whole song about like love or something like it's, That's awesome. it's yeah, it's not. Oh yeah. Here, oh, here's the star Trek ones. I, I, I don't know. I still like Bill Murray Star Wars now that you mention it. Ah, oh, Star Wars. <laughs> Nothing but Star Wars. Give so Wheel of Fortune, Wars. guys. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Back to Wheel Watchers. Who who of us was a Wheel Watcher? Who was a Wheel Watcher? I did well, for a solid year. Did you? I lived with my grandparents. Well, we were building our house, and we lived there, and every night was Wheel of Fortune. Well, I, I got to say, in the '80s, when it when it before the Wheel Watcher era, uh, when it was just the, you know the Wheel of oh, Fortune, yeah. and they didn't have everything was just a straight. It was a it was a phrase or a thing. Mm-hmm. That, none of this before and after, and they and didn't give you that crazy, three letters. But the best part, no, but the R S D L N E was yeah, you, you had, had to, to say those. it. Yeah, but the best part wasn't just cash, right? It was buying your prizes at the end it was buying your prizes. your head would be end, put in then... a little circle yep. <laughs> on the top i'll take the uh the mustang uh-huh. yeah. and that boat over there Ooh. Yep. and it all depended too like if, if you won one round you might be shopping in the kitchen and the next round the person who would win would be shopping in the bedroom or you know, yeah. the garage or something like that um, i remember there was always this like ceramic dalmatian <laughs> You could win this. Well, right. And at the end, if you had, you know, you, you bought your stuff and then you'd have a hundred or $200 left and nothing to buy. 
you could take the balance in a service merchandise gift certificate. That's right. Oh, oh my. It, I, it wasn't something from Van Cleef on our pals. No. It's a service <laughs> merchandise gift certificate. Nice. This is another game we had on DOS on our first computer, Wheel of Fortune. And they did give you RSTLNE. I had the Jeopardy game on the Apple II and was quite adept at it. I, it was tough because I remember playing this because I was only in first grade and we got it and I didn't understand the thing of like, what is, who is? I was like, just okay. let me answer the question. Like, but, you know. <laughs> well, the, the Apple II version, it didn't matter how you phrased your answer. They, they, as long as the answer was right, you get who is, what is. Gotcha. It didn't matter. And I did meet a girl who won Teen Wheel of Fortune. She guessed microscope is the proper answer and she won a Mustang. And when I met her, she her dad still had the Mustang they won in the garage, like mint condition. Nice. So, so the old hacky joke, uh, the airline joke of game show jokes, is that you know the the dichotomy between watching Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. Jeopardy is supposed to be for like super brainiacs, mm-hmm. and Wheel of yes. Fortune is supposed to be dumbed down for the to the lowest denominator. I, I got to tell you, I'm not good at Wheel of Fortune. I I, I feel pretty good at Jeopardy. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes. Unless it's like about literature or English cabinet making or yeah, like that. anything Todd would get. That's, <laughs> right. Todd would be great on Jeopardy. Maple, I feel like mapling syrup. <laughs> you know? uh, Alex, give me mapling syrup for a thousand. Let's go big right off the rip. You just nail them all. <laughs> so here's what I'll tell you. Here's what I'll tell you about that, Brian. So on Wheel of Fortune, you have the opportunity in a half hour. To make, I've seen people come off of that show with upwards of like sixty and seventy thousand dollars. You're right. On Jeopardy, you're lucky if you clear twenty, 20 to thirty. Twenty, yeah. If you're so really good. if you're yeah. smart enough to go on Jeopardy, you're smart enough to know that you should be on Wheel of Fortune <laughs> and just dominating it. You're, you're you're right. It's just for me when I see those words, and I and I play a lot of Scrabble now, but uh, I, I'm just it just not, like I'm looking at them and looking at them and looking at them and. It just doesn't jump out at me a lot of times. And I always feel like, oh my God, I, I like when I get it right, I'm like, I can't believe I got that right. I feel like though it doesn't matter how good you are, the wheel could still screw you. you oh could yeah. Get that bankrupt, bankrupt and that's it. And then I feel like too, some people when you'd watch it, they'd get a real good spin. I wonder how heavy that actually is <laughs> to spin that thing. Like same thing with the the price is right wheel. You know, like what does that actually feel wouldn't, like? Wouldn't that be a great attraction in the park if they just like had those wheels? They just walk just over and go up and give it a spin throw. just just to know what it's like. Yeah. yeah. So I believe, and I'm trying. This is the one thing where my memory is failing me, and I can't find any documentation. But I believe when Wheel of Fortune was there, it was set up kind of the same way as uh, Let's Make a Deal, where when they weren't filming, they did a mock version of the show that regular guests got to participate in so i'm if anybody remembers this or can definitively say one way or the other please write us because i swear they did the same thing you know they didn't they didn't have pat and vanna they had other people but you could as a regular person you could come up and grab the wheel and give her a spin so todd you you walked the set apparently well we didn't walk the set when when you took the tour uh, the walking tour of Disney MGM Studios. There was, uh, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, how three or four tiers that you would walk through, right? On the backside of the sound stage, looking through the You glass. were, yeah, you were kind of up, up on high. the, would be like the third or fourth floor. Right, and there were, there, were mul- there were railings separating the multiple levels that you were on in there as well. Uh, and we got to look down at the set. They weren't, they weren't filming at the time. Uh, but I saw the, you know, the stage, the, the, they had the audience chair set up, the wheel was there, the big, you know, a golden arch, two arches around the the letters, and it was all set up. And I want to say that was around. It either had to be late eighties, early nineties, some somewhere in there. Now, was that part of the the backlot tour? Like you did that yes. too? Was that whatever the super long? That was part so of I the had... long walking tour. So now I think about yeah, I mean, the post production. It, it opened tour. in eighty. It opened eighty nine, so it had to be early nineties. I would say probably it was probably yeah, 90, it was nineteen ninety two. It was ninety one when it was filmed okay. There. So yeah, Gosh, so I don't remember. There. We did that tour, but I don't remember what we saw. Was there a time when there was nothing? Oh yeah, I, I mean, I you'd nothing. most of the time that I went through, I remember seeing pretty much nothing. I was excited at that time to see that. You know, <laughs> was, like ah, oh, something's so, in here. Yeah. Yeah, so sometimes, JT, they would pull curtains across it if it was something they didn't actually yeah. want to see anybody looking down on. And there was, during that stretch, there were a number of films, uh, 
shot there, like Passenger 57 oh, and some yeah. Disney Channel films. Thunder. Uh, so there might have been some times when, when there was something. But I remember we would go and you'd look down and you'd see the Mickey Mouse. Uh, oh, yeah. The Mickey... Mickey Mouse Club set. That was set, always on like, like on quite stage often. Three, I, think, well, right? I feel like I might have seen the Mickey Mouse Club set now that I think about it because I watched that. Interesting. Yeah. Now, how you guys can tell me this? What set or area did the catwalk bar look over? Was it this one? That looked over the soundstage restaurant over in the animation courtyard. So Wheel of Fortune taped on the ever popular stage one uh, in September of 1991. They did 20 shows that aired from October 20th uh, to November 11th of that year. And then they came back in March of 1992 and recorded another 20 episodes. And a little, I don't know if it's a fun fact or not, but it's a fact. Um, They didn't use any of the post-production facilities at Disney MGM to actually package up the show after it was taped. Um, They had mobile uh, broadcast booths that they did all of that in. So they saved a little money by doing it themselves. But... They're probably used to traveling around the country doing this stuff anyway, so they, they just have all the equipment anyhow. So uh, so this is going to be the final question. Oh, Brian's in the lead. It's only a tie or a win. I'll take myself out of this one. No, 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 right. no, no. You got me in. All right, here we go. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> all right. So what TV game show was so popular after its initial 13-episode run that it was broadcast five nights a week in its second season? Oh, Todd. All right, Todd, you're in. Who wants to be a millionaire? From the four corners of the continent, we have flown them to New York City. People just like you, who called our phone number dreaming of instant riches. Will one of them seize this day, have the knowledge and the courage to change the course of their lives in one short evening? Starting tonight and every night for the next two weeks, join us from New York City as we play Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Hey, Todd, yes. is that your final it answer? It is my final answer. I'm not phoning a friend, <laughs> and I'm not using my 50 for your lifeline. <laughs> the AT&T phone a friend. That's right. <laughs> now, at Disney MGM, it was called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Play, Play. it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> With an exclamation point. Now, I feel like, was this one whole totally fake? I mean, This one I guess, remember right? going well, and well, doing. Well, you didn't actually become a millionaire at Disney MGM. Obviously. <laughs> Obviously. But there was Regis was never there. No. These were never televised. No, this no, was just no. a ride. They were yeah, hosted so by a cast member. The usually successful show, as you mentioned, starring Regis Philbin, aired from August 16th, 1999 to June 22nd, 2000. Uh, 2002 and it was a cultural phenomenon yeah. it was the first tv show to offer a million dollar grand prize i mean i think you everybody was talking about it i remember yep like people at work were crazy for it it was it, i remember when nuts. the first million dollar winner like leaked somehow and everybody's like i think tonight's the night i've been hearing things and this was like before the internet was big so how'd that leak out yeah. and, i i think it was also you can take that show and and, and attribute all the you know, additional evening game shows that started to use the dark sets and the fancy music yep. and the lights that would flash down. I mean, you had, uh, you know, after that, you had what was that game with Howie Mandel and the cases? Oh, the 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 uh, the oh god, it's terrible. Deal or no deal, deal. or no deal. Uh, yep. And there's a whole host of other ones that came out for short runs like that. The, the the British lady, the weakest link, weakest link. Yeah, who weakest wants? Link. Uh, you're smarter than a fifth grader, or whatever. All that they, yeah. they all. Oh gosh, that. But one. they really all drew on that suspense. And if you listen to them, the the production value of those, or the and and the format was very very similar. Yeah, all the stuff with the like you said, all the lights yeah. on <laughs> motors that could spin down on the, the exactly. all the <laughs> super dramatic music. Absolutely, um, yeah. So. Um, the show was co-produced by Disney-owned Valley Crest Productions and distributed by Disney ABC Home Entertainment and Television Distribution, mm. which is a mouthful, uh, was formerly known as Buena Vista Television. So, hey, what a surprise. Here is Buena Vista Television again. Um, so it's it's actually not shocking that it eventually became an attraction. It was never filmed at Disney, G- Disney MGM. Uh, there was also a Disney's California Adventure version which it was not filmed at Disney's California Adventure either. It was just a a big fake. Um, the set was designed to look exactly, or as, as least as close as they could come to the production in uh, in New York, where it was actually filmed. 
Um, and if you guys remember, the audience had buttons yes. built into their chairs, kind of like Future Choice Theater. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I remember. Now, what was there before play? It wasn't that superstar television or no so that this was also in in um this was i think in studio three so eventually toy story midway mania would be in this this was after the downfall of the walking tour when it was greatly reduced and you stopped going through some of the uh uh the sound stages that they were you know that's this the last one what was the last one used uh Maybe that was one where I saw Wheel of Fortune. I can't remember what was on. There. I think I think Studio actually no. I think it's coming to think. I think Studio One was like the last holdout because that was the one that was finally just converted. Like where they're adding the track onto Toy Story Midway right, Mini right. now was the Studio One. So that would have been the far left if you were walking down the street yep. there. So I rem I remember going into um, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire play it. I think it was around two thousand. Two, 2002 is when I went. Uh, and I do remember the buttons on the seats. I can't remember the format, but I, something of the buttons was what chose the person. Like if you, it wasn't right. the quickest answer, so, something like that. Right. There was a thing called the fastest finger round and you were given four, <laughs> four things and you had to put them in chronological order. So I, so whoever could put the stuff in order faster, I think you'd be like, you know, was the order D C A B or B A D C or whatever, and like that would be the person that would be right, picked for right. the hot seat. But oh, the hot seat. And then the um the phone a friend lifeline became phone a complete stranger, <laughs> and there was a cast member with <laughs> a cell phone outside. That's awesome. And a they would <laughs> they would call, and then they would you'd call a number, and the cast member would go find someone that was walking by the attraction outside, and they would stop a random person okay. and have them be your lifeline. JT. Line. Yes, You're, sir. The, the, the spinning wheel broke, right? The computer, you get the burned out ROM. Yep. And what the ping pong machine was done, right? <laughs> that was a one-shot. It was shot a one-shot. Yes. So prize pot, we are going to utilize this, and we are going to have somebody, an on-the-beat reporter in, you want to do studios? We'll put somebody in the studios. We'll put somebody over at uh, Epcot, whatever. We'll call them, and we'll get a random person to call out a number. for for. So stay tuned for December. I think that's the way... We got to pick it. That's that's nice. Let's I do like it during uh, you guys when you're down there. I'll call you from Ohio. Okay. I'll call you. Give it to the random person when you're in the park. Perfect. And, you know, Brian. Brian will love it. I know that he's going to be there for it. We're counting on you to record <laughs> it all, JT. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> there we go. Uh, See, look at that. We're we're utilizing you know previous technology and ideas. Have a complete stranger pick the number. That's like. right. <laughs> I think we should go to where the giant phone used to be in Epcot. And uh, where would it have the, been? That's a good question. And where right where Siemens is, all the Siemens stuff when you come out. To, oh, it was yeah. in the okay yeah, originally. Right. Yeah. So standing there, that's perfect. Yeah. So yeah, so finally it would have been in the global, global bit, where the global village was. The original location is now. I mean, what did we figure that was? So future com is oh is now like the Mickey one of the meet and greet areas. Yeah, but I remember seeing it as you came off Spaceship Earth. It was tucked away in the right yeah. hand side. Yeah. Yep. You guys all, all have right. to be wearing like a matching shirt because you're gonna have to look official. You know, if you're just random somebody like punch you in the face, like get away from me. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of playing for money, contestants played for points, and then you won who wants to be a millionaire merchandise like pins, t shirts, and CD ROMs. CD ROMs. Love it. And the grand prize was a three night Disney cruise. And I looked on eBay today. There were pins that you would get when you hit each of the point levels. So like 100, 200, 400. And then uh, if you got 1,000 points, you got a baseball cap. Oh. And then polo shirts for 32,000 points. What? So, That's a big jump. Yeah. <laughs> I don't there, I'm sure there must have been some more stuff in between. I just don't Do know Do we know if anybody uh, ever completed it or, or worked our way up pretty high? Yeah, I, I think some people won the cruises. I'm pretty oh. sure. So uh, the game show version at Disney MGM opened on April 7th, 2001, and it actually remained long open after the uh, the show went into syndication. And the show at Disney MGM finally closed on August 19th, 2006. And as we talked about, it finally made way for Toy Story Midway mm -hmm. Mania. They rung that they rung that chamois out to as long as they could. 2006, oh, they... who wants to be a millionaire was like forgotten. <laughs> I mean, it was still in syndication with Meredith Vieira as the host, I yeah. think, until like 2012, and then it, I think it went into 2014 or 15. I feel like after the first million was won, it was just 
like the to me at that my high school age the the luster was lost i was like all right that's that's it let's just well, yeah well once of, you win one of the things that guys like todd and us the allure of that show was you 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 wanted to see who are the morons that can't win thirty two thousand dollars because that was that that was the easy part right like, you could get through like five questions or whatever it was and you could get to the seven question and get to the 32 grand and then quit and you're like all right i you know i, I can pay my bills i could like let me get out of here and so then you'd watch him go 64 120 like what are you doing like this is crazy and I, I like it all right let's rifle off these first five these are quick ones beetle juice yeah. final answer no you lose the first one <laughs> <laughs> yeah and that was always like that was the the, co- the water cooler talk was when like, somebody just, lost at 100 or 200 like you oh, see this guy brain fart right at the first yeah. round i did i did i do remember was it was it the first guy that won was the one who used his lifeline on the million dollar question to call his dad um <laughs> i like to call my parents right now sure use my lifeline call my parents what are their names oh uh, um my father i'll talk to my father does tom. he have a name tom. he does okay. have a name yes tom <laughs> All right. Our friends at AT&T will get uh, your dad on the line, and we'll see if he can help you. Hello? Hello, Tom. Yes? Hi, Regis Philbin here from Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Hi. We've got uh, your son, John, uh, with us right now. He's doing pretty well. Good. He's won a half million dollars. Wow. And he's going for a million dollars. (laughs) And he needs your help to get there. Okay. So he's going to come on the line, read a question, four possible answers. One of them is the right answer. And uh, the next voice you hear will be John's. John, you've got 30 seconds. Starts right now. Uh, hi, Dad. Hi. Uh, I don't really need your help, but I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to win the million dollars. <laughs> exactly. Because yeah. he knew the he, answer. Like, he just yeah. Ban- yeah, like he hammered yeah. through him, I recall. Like he knew everything or something. He's yeah. like, no lifelines or... I forget. He was just toying with the game. That was a that was a that great was, way to uh, come John off. That was John Carpenter. I just found it here. Oh, nice! I liked Starman. Director of like Halloween and <laughs> Escape from New York. <laughs> Escape the from thing, New York. The thing, right? That he was the, the thing. The president of what? I wonder how he got on the show after being such a successful director. <laughs> so, what else we have? How? Anything else there in the chronicles of game show history? No, that was, as far as I know, that was the last game show filmed at Disney MGM because they just don't film anything at Disney MGM. Now, some some game shows still make the rounds and stop at Walt Disney World and, and film there. I think Wheel of Fortune will still do weeks yeah. at, at places occasionally now and then. Uh, but, you know, since the permanent facilities are closed, it's like we're, we're not going to see any full-scale production there. Uh, anytime and soon. Universal Studios have taken away a little bit too, because I think I think uh, Wheel of Fortune was a Universal at one point. So this a little okay. bit of competition down the street. They still do have two working full studios at Universal, so okay. I think they still they? film some wrestling things there yeah. uh, these Jimmy days. Fallon's as as there. there, yeah, yeah. And did you JT? Did you know they actually filmed wrestling? Uh, they filmed a, what was it Nitro or something? WCW Nitro at Disney MGM for a while. I could see it was Hulk Hogan because that was his WCW era. Um, yeah. And I could see was he doing Thunder in Paradise around the same time. Yep. So or a little bit later. So yeah, there was. I mean, although he's and from we Florida, just so it's probably easy for him. Yeah. So we just talked about the game shows tonight, but there were a host of, of other television shows and things that, that were filmed uh, at the facilities there, and, and we will talk about those on a future episode. All right, well, we've got the tabulation back from the judges, and it looks like our winner today is... Todd! Oh. Todd, hey, 300 you. points. Win a trip so. to Space Camp Adult <laughs> Edition. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for all that research, Hal. Awesome stuff. A nice to f- fun there to play a little bit of game along with us, too. Um, so, merchandise. How you uh, surprised us with some incredible designs these past couple of months. And uh, I, I, I have to say, I'm placing an order. They're on sale right now. Uh, I've got to get an order in for the, the Jungle Cruise in the... The Pablo uh, Jungle Cruise. Pablo Cruise. I, I knew you would like that. that was... <laughs> See, that's when it's both a visual Pablo and Jungle Cruise, like sure. a textual oh, it's fantastic. Pun. So that was a... just seemed perfect. So, Yes. 
I'm, nice. I'm going with the light version on a blue shirt. That's what I'm going to go with. So, but you also did the updated the Lake and Lagoon Tour Discovery Edition with a rubber stamp on it with the Discovery uh, River boats. Oh on there. yeah, and uh, you also did the Person of Those the Century selling. T-shirt. Which I'm says, just getting alerts. Left I am right. the I person. Got one of the order century, here. Some weird so. like four versions. Yeah, of, like for every season, a hoodie, a, a short sleeve, everything. <laughs> just year round wear, wear right there. That's it. That's awesome. Once we get the underwear thing going, it's like then it's going to be perfect. We'll have, we'll have the entire market cornered. So <laughs> yeah, and I'm working on some stuff for this month. So That's right. we'll see if That's we can get right. it done so soon because you know Christmas is coming okay. up, giving season and whatnot. So yeah, I'm gonna get some new designs out there. That's right. That's right. Awesome. We'll be looking forward to them. All right. We also, uh, as, as many of you know, we have a donation page set up uh, uh, on our website where you can click and uh, donate and uh, to the to keeping Retro WDW on the air and on the web because uh, it certainly does take a lot of bit of uh, d- certainly does take a lot of cash to to keep this running. So we really do appreciate everybody who who makes a donation. Um, we did receive a, a, a really nice donation um, from Anthony Slamen uh, just this past week. So kudos and a big thanks to him for, for helping support us uh, and keeping us going. So again, anything that you purchase or donations to us uh, stays right here within Retro WDW uh, and helps bring the, the TV, uh, <clears throat> helps bring the podcast to you, all the films, the restoration, the websites, etc., cetera, uh, and also keeping everything running. So Appreciate everybody who's purchased and donated. Uh, and if you'd like to, you can get all of our merchandise at retrowdw.com forward slash support us. And the donation link is right on the, the main page of retrowdw.com. All right, guys. Well, thanks to all of our listeners. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or you want to reach us, feel free to send us your stories and whatnot to podcast at retrowdw.com. We'll see you next month. And until then, Brian, take us out. Follow Todd McCartney and Retro WDW on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Retro WDW. For all things Retro Disney World, including exclusive merchandise, visit us on the web at RetroWDW.com. On Twitter, follow our web designer, Jason Bartell of Deepwater Studios, at JasonDWS. Our announcer, Andre Gardner, at Andre Gardner. And follow our hosts, Hal Bowers, on Twitter and Instagram, at GoAwayGreen and on the web at kingdomofmemories.com. For J.T. Couser on Twitter, at LS1JT, on YouTube at Rubber City Motoring, and on the web at rubbercitymotoring.com. And you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, at Brian P. Miles. Oh, God, no more.